it's being recorded and are you happy and um, so that's all good so Rihanna and Ben as I say if you wouldn't mind just admitting people as they join beeps not standing and we'll get started because it is five um, no it's not it's three thirty four so Welcome everybody to CIPD's um, Essex and Ipswich Employment Law Update and HR Update with Birkett Long. So um, joining me today as um, the partner and head of employment at Birkett Long, I have Rihanna Billington Purvis, um, who is a solicitor in the team. And also we have Ben Molyneux, who is a trainee solicitor in the team. So welcome to you both and thank you for, for joining us today. Um, just before we do get into the update, um, brief word, if I may, about upcoming events um, that CIPD Essex and Ipswich are hosting. And as we have got so many of you um, here, I should just explain that as well as being a partner at Birkett Long and the employment team, I am also co-chair of the Essex and Ipswich branch which is why I am just introducing this event. So we do have, as I say, two events coming up, one on the 16th of November on building and owning your professional network, enriched study experience. And also on the 21st, we have equity and first hiring. You can find details of those on the Essex and Ipswich Eventbrite page. Um, or if you have your phone to hand, you can scan the QR code and that will take you to the to the page. And I'll show that towards the end as well. So just briefly, as I say, we've got myself, Julie, um, Rihanna and Ben, who are going to be taking you through the world of employment law and HR as we're sitting here today. And we will be, as quite often is the case, looking backwards in terms of what what has happened legislation wise looking forwards legislation wise having a look at some recent cases flagging up some new and updated guidance that's been published recently and a new addition to the update um, for today is a, a list of actions for you to take away and i very much hope that that list might not be as long as perhaps it seems on the slide so oh, I am going to move and um, pass across to Rihanna, who's going to be looking back. Thank you, Julie. Welcome, everyone. So just to touch on, as Julie said, looking back, some things that came in this year, this year with respect um, to employment law, specifically national minimum wage, but the majority um, of things we'll be focusing on looking forward and what's to come. But quickly, just to talk about what happened in April this year. As happens every April, uh, the national minimum wage was increased and the figures are on screen. So as of the 1st of April 2023, those 23 or over are due to receive £10.42 an hour. And that is now in effect um, and so on. I, I won't read everything out, but that, that's what happened in April of this year. If we skip forward now to looking forward with uh, still staying with national minimum wage, there is going to be the usual increases um, on the 1st of April, as there is every year, as I said. But the interesting thing here is that there's um, a projected increase of between £10.90 and £11.43. And there's been quite a lot in the news about this kind of jump up in the national minimum wage. It's not yet confirmed what the increase is going to be. And a central estimate of £11.16 has been suggested. So that's something to, to bear in mind. It, it could potentially go up by quite a large uh, amount in the grand scheme of things. And it's also um, been discussed that the Low Pay Commission, who are the committee which produced the recommendations, have said that they're actually looking to lower the pay threshold from 23. So where we've got 23 or over, that's potentially going to be lowered to 21 um, and over from next year. So that's another thing to, to look out for. And the Low Pay Commission usually gives its official recommendation in November. So that's when we're going to know for certain uh, what the figures are. But also bear in mind, depending on what happens with uh, any general election, any changes in government, we could see some further changes. But that's something to note looking forward. 
So next slide, please, Julie. Thank you. As I said, there's quite a lot of things to look forward to um, with respect to employment law. And a lot of these you perhaps heard of, have heard of already, these acts that I'm going to mention. Um, but to start with, I'm talking a little bit about the Carers Leave Act, which um, is expected in April 2024. And this act is going to give employees who are caring for a dependent with a long term need an entitlement to a week of flexible unpaid leave in any 12 months. Now, I just mentioned they're caring for a dependent with a long term need. And if I just unpack the wording a little bit there, dependent refers to a spouse, a civil partner, a child, a parent or a person who lives in the same household as the employee, but not as an employee, tenant or lodger or boarder or a person who reasonably relies on the employee for care. So that's dependent. And then long term care need is defined as an illness or injury be that physical or mental, which requires or is likely to require care for more than three months, a disability under the Equality Act 2010 or issues relating to old age. So we expect that under regulations which are yet to be passed, and that's quite important, that this hasn't come into effect yet, but under these regulations, we anticipate that the employee will be entitled to take uh, the leave in individual days or half days. And that's a contrast with parental leave, which most of you will be aware can only be used in blocks of a week or whole numbers of weeks. Also, the employee will will be entitled to claim leave from the first day of their employment and they'll be protected from dismissal or any detriment as a result of having exercised their right to take carer's leave. An employee will be required to give notice of carer's leave and the notice period must be twice the length of the leave being requested plus one day. The employer can postpone but they can't deny a request for carer's leave and this postponement will only be possible where the employer is able to show that the operation of their business will be unduly disrupted if they allow the leave to take place in a certain time. And employees, interestingly, will be entitled to self-certify their entitlement and claim the leave without having to produce evidence. So when will these new rights apply? Well, as I said at the beginning, it's expected that implementation will be introduced no later than April 2024. So something to, to keep um, an eye on as we progress into the new year. The next um, act I want to talk about is the Protection from Redundancy, Pregnancy and Family Leave Act. At present, um, as you'll all be aware, in a redundancy situation, employees on maternity, adoption or shared parental leave have an automatic right to be offered any suitable vacancies where they're available as priority over others. However, this act is going to extend this right and it's expected it will be applicable during pregnancy, maternity, adoption and parental leave and for six months after a return to work. Again, we await the full re regulations in order to uncover the detail, but that's what inevitably is going to happen. In terms of when these new rights are going to take um, effect, the, the Act is in force, but again, the government needs to make re regulations to actually extend the redundancy protection for those on maternity and other family related leave. Government has said it will do so, uh, do so in due course, which I think we're all familiar with. Uh, we don't really know what when due course is. Um, but as at their press release dated the 25th of May this year, they said um, it's going to be in due course. And we've anticipated this to mean at some time during 2024. So not yet, but again, something to be aware of. So that was protection from redundancy in the act there. The next act is the Employment Relations Flexible Working Act, which um, I'm sure many of you are aware of. Flexible working, very topical um, subject and has been since the pandemic. So under this act, um, the proposed changes will mean that employees can make a flexible working request from day one of employment or on day one of employment even, um, whereas under the current legislation, 26 weeks continuous service is required. In addition, employees are going to be able to make two requests in any 12 month period. 
as opposed to one, which they can make now. And employers will have a shortened time frame of two months in which to grant requests, whereas currently there's a three month window in which to decide. There's also going to be a new duty to discuss alternatives to the request um, and a duty on employers to consider whether there are any other alternative forms of flexible working available. And interestingly enough, the employee isn't going to have to explain how their request is going to impact on the employer anymore. It's not certain whether that's going to be a requirement or, or just guidance at this stage, but something to bear in mind. And it's worth pointing out that there's going to be no changes to the eight reasons that an employer has to refuse a request for flexible working. So requests st still can be refused um, under those eight reasons. I won't go through them all, but reasons such as a burden of additional cost, if there's going to be a detrimental impact on the quality of work or an employee's performance, those are all valid reasons to reject an, a, a request. As a result um, of this legislation, ACAS is updating its statutory code of practice and they've opened a consultation or they had opened a consultation on this code and it closed on the 6th of September. So they're in the process of reviewing those responses um, and we should receive that code of practice in due course. This act has received royal assent um, and again we're awaiting regulations to actually implement the, the act um, and we expect this in July, uh, August of next year. So that's flexible working. Next act is the Workers Predictable Terms and Conditions Act and again this received royal assent this year in September so, so recently. Um, and when enacted, this act is going to give workers specifically a statutory right to request a more predictable working pattern, which is something that unions um, and think tanks have been calling for for some time. And the idea is that's going to address the uncertainty that can come along with forms of atypical work. So this right is going to apply to the following workers, those whose existing working patterns lack certainty in terms of the hours or times they work. So, for example, those on zero hour contracts, those also on fixed term contracts of 12 months or less, and also agency workers. The qualifying period to make such a request for a more predictable working pattern, we think is likely to be um, 26 week service, but these weeks are not going to need to be continuous and a maximum of two applications can be made in any 12 month period. As with flexible working, yes, you're right. The slide does say 2003. It should say 2023. Apologies about that. I noted that in my notes as well. But yes, uh, well spotted, keeping you on, our, on your toes. So sorry, as I was saying, um, a maximum of two applications can be made in any 12 month period. And like flexible working, employers um, are going to have to deal with any requests in a reasonable manner and notify the worker of their decision within one month. Like with flexible working, requests can be refused on certain grounds and there are six grounds um, that these requests can be refused with. If a request is granted, however, employers need to offer new terms within two weeks of granting the request, so quite quickly. And if an employer unreasonably refuses the request, then the employee will have a complaint that they can bring in the employment tribunal. So the Act is expected to come into force in September 2024, and that's approximately a year after it received royal assent. And again, um, accompanying the Act will be an ACAS code of practice guide. As of the 20th of October, so last week, uh, ACAS launched, uh, launched sorry, their, their consultation on this code. The code's not going to be legally binding, but as with the other codes of practice, it's going to be taken into account by the courts and employment tribunals when considering relevant cases. So will be worth getting your heads around. Um, and the consultation for the ACAS code of practice, the draft one, is going to close on the 17th of January 2024. So worth um, getting responses in if that's something you're interested in. So that's the Workers Predictable Terms and Conditions Act. The last update from me is uh, regarding the Neonatal Care Leave and Pay Act. And we've got 2023 on the slide there, which is great. 
So employees who have parental responsibility of a baby up to the age of 28 days and the baby has received neonatal care for a period of at least seven days will be entitled to at least one week's paid leave, which must be taken before at least 68 weeks from the date of the child's birth. We expect regulations which aren't yet in, uh, you know, haven't yet been enforced, but we expect these regulations to provide for leave of up to 12 weeks with the right to take neonatal care and this applies from the first day of employment. In terms of the pay element, the right to neonatal care pay will apply to all employees with at least 26 weeks continuous service and whose weekly earnings are at um, or above the lower earnings limit, which is currently £123 per week for 23-24. And this is slightly longer in terms of when we expect this to come in. We expect that the new rights are going to take effect by April 2025. Um, and this significant lead in time is purposeful, as the government has said, we need some time for HMRC systems to be updated. So we have a little longer for this one, but certainly something to keep in mind um, and be aware of. So those are my looking forward updates. I'll pass on to Ben now, who is going to take you through um, third party harassment, I believe. That's right. Thank you, Rihanna. Thank you. So I'm going to delve into an important, important development in employment law, and that's the introduction of the Worker Protection Act, which is going to make amendments to the Equality Act 2010. In particular, in what I'm going to speak about this afternoon, are the amendments that this new law will make in relation to sexual harassment in the workplace and employer accountability. But before I dive into that, I just wanted to first discuss vicarious liability, specifically in the context of sexual harassment. So sexual harassment is defined under Section 26 of the Equality Act. And a broad definition is that sexual harassment involves unwanted sexual conduct that violates someone's dignity and creates an offensive environment. And as with other breaches of the Equality Act, such as other forms of, harass of harassment and discrimination, employers are prima facie liable for sexual harassment committed by their employees during the course of their employment. And, and that's the case whether the employer was aware of the se sexual harassment or not. Um, so that, that in a nutshell is vicarious liability. So let's discuss now um, how employers can look to avoid, avoid vicarious liability for sexual harassment under the current wording of the Equality Act. So as the law stands today without amendment that I'll come on to shortly, an employer may look to avoid being vicariously liable for sexual harassment where it can demonstrate that it took all reasonable steps to prevent it. This is found in the wording of Section 109 of the Equality Act. And what Section 109 says essentially is that an employer can raise a defence to liability if it can prove that they did everything reasonable to prevent such, to prevent such behaviour, such harassment occurring in the first place. Although while this is an option for employers, it's important to note that the defence will not be successful if there was a reasonable further step that the employer could have taken to prevent the sexual harassment, even if that reasonable further step wouldn't have actually prevented it in the first place. On the slide, I've listed um, some reasonable steps employers can take to prevent sexual harassment. And these can, these, this list isn't exhaustive, but hopefully it gives you an idea of what reasonable steps employers should be taking. So having the correct policies in place, making sure those policies are regularly reviewed by all staff, so increasing awareness both, both with existing staff and also new employees, ensuring all staff have adequate and appropriate training to address general and known issues in the workplace, as well as training for more senior members of staff, such as managers and supervisors, on not only how to identify um, harassment, but also how to, end, uh, how to um, handle issues of harassment. And, and this leads nicely on to enforcement and in terms of dealing effectively with complaints, including taking the appropriate disciplinary action when necessary. Now let's, let's discuss the, the introduction now of the Worker Protection Act, which is 
on the on the next slide. So the Worker Protection Bill received royal assent last Thursday on the 26th of October, meaning that the Worker Protection Act is is now an act of Parliament and it's expected to be in full force in October next year. So once the act is is in force next year, it will make significant amendments and changes in the way employers are held responsible for issues relating to workplace sexual harassment. I want to first discuss third party harassment and the introduction of this act does not introduce employer liability for third party harassment. This means that when a client or a customer sexually harasses an employee, the employer will not be expressly liable for third party's actions which is interesting because the initial wording of the bill included an express duty on employers to prevent sexual harassment from third parties. However, whilst the bill was making its way through Parliament, the House of Lords elected to remove this duty. And therefore, it does remain, even following next year, that there won't be an explicit duty on an employer to prevent harassment from third parties. Although at this stage, I think it is important to note that employers cannot simply just ignore such harassment from third parties, such as customers or clients, just because there isn't an express duty on the employer to prevent it. Because if they did choose to ignore it, ignore it and, and choose to you know, close the blind eye to it, this may potentially open um, a number of claims and open the door to a number of claims, including sex discrimination and potentially constructive unfair dismissal, if certain requirements are met. So the the introduce when when this act is is enforced next year, what changes will it make? Well, the first one is that it, the act will introduce a mandatory duty on all employers, every employer, to take reasonable steps to prevent sexual harassment of employees during the course of their employment. When provisionally worded, the duty, this mandatory duty I'm referring to, did require all employer all employers to take all reasonable steps. However, the House of Lords watered this duty down so that the duty now is for employers to take reasonable steps, not all reasonable steps. The second change is that employment tribunals will now have the power to uplift sexual harassment compensation by up to 25% where an employer has, has failed to comply with this mandatory duty and they failed to take those reasonable steps. So what does this mean for the employer? Well, once the Act comes into force next year, the defence for employers for sexual harassment by employees is somewhat a lower hurdle to achieve, as they no longer have to take all reasonable steps. But instead, the employer only needs to demonstrate that reasonable steps were taken before the event, and thus satisfying this new mandatory duty that will come into play next year. However, the risk of penalty is greater. This, the introduction of this uplift of 25% means that the compensation employers will have to pay out will essentially be more if they fail to um, satisfy this new duty. These two, these two changes then combined will mean it will continue to be even more important for employers to ensure those reasonable steps are taken. Although it may not be all reasonable steps, it's still important to comply with this new mandatory duty to prevent that uplift of compensation. There is currently no guidance as to the meaning and, inter and interpretation of reasonable steps. However, it does seem likely that employment tribunals will continue to interpret reasonable steps to the existing employer's defence of taking all reasonable steps. If we then go on to the next slide, please. Um, I just wanted to briefly mention the training we can offer Burkett Long in terms of assisting employers in taking the necessary measures to prevent vicariously li vicarious liability for workplace sexual harassment. We, we do often provide training to companies about acceptable behaviours in the workplace and provide training on how and when to enforce policies to ensure full compliance with them. We can also implement and review appropriate policies to tackle workplace sexual harassment and, pro and also provide refresher training on those policies if necessary. But ultimately, what workplace training can do is it can help employers take those reasonable steps I mentioned earlier and therefore help prevent sexual har harassment in the workplace. 
But not only this, but by taking these steps in terms of staff training and having up-to-date policies will ultimately help employers avoid being liable for employee sexual harassment, as it will ultimately help ensure employers comply with this new mandatory duty. On the slide, you'll also find other forms of training we can offer, and further information on those tra training courses can be found on our website. That, that's all from me in this section. Thank you, Ben. Right, so I'm going to do a quick segue, just very briefly. Um, on the slide, you'll see a quote from an email that I received from a, a client last week, um, which humbled me, frankly. Um, it's very nice when we do get positive comments from our from our clients, but I was particularly chuffed, for want of a better expression, about about that one. Um, also, I mean, ben, Ben's just mentioned we can provide training, and obviously there are other training providers out there. Um, but we do also provide a HR and employment law service um, under the guise of BLHR, in addition to the usual services that you would expect of, of employment law solicitors. Um, BLHR is a fixed fee um, and you can access us um, by email, by phone, as much as you like. Um, and you know, if that is something that you are interested in, in terms of support for your organisation, then please, please do get in touch. I'm not going to say anything more about, about us as, um, in terms of what we can offer, but as I say, if you do need support, you, you know where we are. And I'm going to pass back to Rihanna, who's just going to talk you through one of the recent cases before I, I wrap up. Thank you, Julie. Um, so the case I've chosen to share with you all today is the case of Anderson and Thistle Marine Peterhead Limited and others. Um, so a recent case, judgment was received this year, and it's a case about menopause um, and discrimination and constructive unfair dismissal. And, it, and is something we're seeing come through the employment tribunals um, a lot more frequently, certainly. So just wanted to touch on the findings of the case and, and some key takeaways that, that I think are really important. So Mrs Anderson is the claimant and she uh, was an office manager employed by Thistle Marine for 27 years, so a long period of service. And she was hardworking and well thought of by the owners and the directors of the business um, and had been no issues to date. In August 2021, she informed her employer that she was going through menopause and experiencing symptoms. The symptoms um, she was experiencing specifically were loss of concentration, brain fog and anxiety. And whilst she didn't make any requests for modifications to her working arrangement, her employer was initially very supportive and they even agreed to pay for private health care so that she could discuss her symptoms with a doctor and for a treatment plan to be agreed upon. So all good so far. However, in December 2022, she worked from home for two days, firstly because of heavy snow and then because she was unwell due to heavy menopausal bleeding. Upon her return to the office, she was greeted by the company director, Jim Clark, who commented, oh, I see you've made it in. Mrs. Anderson went on to explain why she hadn't been in the office to be given a disgusted look by Mr. Clark before he walked away. Mrs. Anderson was quite hurt and upset by Mr. Clark's behavior and she reported him to HR. Um, and thereafter, she was accused of strolling in and out of work whenever it pleased her, doing what she pleased. And she was questioned about the number of days she had off take uh, she'd taken that year, including during her holiday, which she'd booked. Mr. Clark then made um, the costly comment, as we've coined it, menopause, menopause, everybody effing gets it. Just get on with it. That's your excuse for everything. Now, unsurprisingly, Mrs. Anderson was so upset at Mr. Clark's remarks that she was absent with stress and submitted a grievance regarding her treatment. Her remote access to work systems was cut a day later, meaning that she could no longer work from home. 
So she eventually resigned from her role before bringing claims of constructive unfair dismissal and harassment on the grounds of sex against both the company and Mr Clark individually. Now this went through to the Employment Tribunal and the Employment Tribunal commented that they were left with the strong impression that Mr Clark was spoiling for an opportunity to have a go at the claimant. And despite his actions being sufficiently serious to have allowed Mrs Anderson to resign with immediate effect, she instead tried to, to repair the relationship by raising a grievance. And therefore, the tribunal commented, the company had no right to remove her computer access. They had no difficulty, the Scottish Employment Tribunal, in accepting that Mrs Anderson had been harassed and constructively unfairly dismissed, and she was awarded compensation of £37,000. So what can we take away from this case? Well, as I said, this is something we're seeing um, more often, certainly in the employment tribunal. And it's important to make the point that women in their 50s who are likely to be experiencing or you know, potentially will experience symptoms of menopause are the fastest this growing segment of the workforce um, and therefore this isn't a situation that employers can or should ignore. Employers need to be wary that if they fail to support employees who are going through menopause in a fair way as, as well as equip those around them and provide that support they risk things being said, inappropriate things as in this case um, and support not being given, which can result in claims for constructive and or unfair dismissal, as well as discrimination, as we've seen in Mrs Anderson's case. It's important to, to note that menopause is not, and it's confirmed that it's not going to be a protected characteristic um, of its own. So there was a consultation on this, but a committee decided, or the government ultimately decided, that they were not going to make menopause a protected characteristic. But individuals can still bring a claim in the employment tribunal based on the protected characteristics of age, disability or sex, which is what Mrs Anderson did. These protections are available for employees if they've been put at a disadvantage and treated less favourably as a result of their menopause and or symptoms. As I said, claims being brought in the employment tribunal, which centre around menopause, have, have tripled um, in less than two years. I mean, we've certainly seen more of them, but the, the actual research is that they've tripled in less than two years. And a key feature of these of these cases being brought in the employment tribunal is the language that's been used in the workplace. And there are often reports of throwaway comments or derogatory language aimed at someone who has spoken up about going through menopause. For a condition once referred to as the change and taboo, clearly uh, the language and attitude and support in the workplace must change. And this case is an example. It really highlights the need for employers to be proactively educating and training staff about menopause and also thinking about appropriate and inoffensive ways um, and the difference between the two and how we should be referring to this natural life event and how to support staff going through the menopause. Now, there are a number of steps um, that employers can take to improve well-being in the workplace relating to menopause. And Julie's going to talk specifically about um, what's come out of a consultation there. But just a couple of points from me. The main thing is implementing a menopause policy. And this can really help to remove the stigma of menopause in the workplace by explaining what it is, firstly, and how it can affect people. And it should also explain what support is available to staff experiencing menopause. And as part of this policy, employers could um, appoint a menopause champion who'd be in charge of the policy. And I think Julie's going to speak on that a little bit more. Next is training. Um, the importance of training can't be understated because it it's really is vital um, that management and HR representatives uh, in particular are fully aware of, of menopause uh, and what the symptoms can be uh, and ha what's the company's stance on it with respect to any policy and are able to confidently uh, respond to and support colleagues in a non-discriminatory and open manner. Doing nothing can sometimes be just as harmful as trying to do something um, but actually getting it wrong. But we acknowledge starting the conversation can be scary and particularly Sometimes male um, employees can can feel um, awkward, perhaps starting those conversations, but training will help to alleviate 
this fear um and just just i've seen some things coming in on the comments so amanda yes earlier than 50 um that's certainly something that that should be acknowledged menopause can happen earlier than 50 um it was just 50 i was saying as, as the the growing um the quickest growing uh, area of the workforce and also kate is menopause a disability so as julie said it, it can be if the symptoms um reach the threshold for disability but again it's not in itself um a disability and and there's not any the government aren't going to make it a protected characteristic so it's usually under the guise of sex disability or age that an individual will bring a claim um, but that's yeah that's it for, for the anderson case so pass on to julie now thanks um rihanna yes i mean the i can't remember if it was last year or the year before there was a consultation around menopause and consideration whether menopause would become its own protected characteristic and the decision was made that it it wouldn't be because it's already covered in terms of sex um, discrimination and also potentially disability but from my own experience um individuals close to me you know menopause can can significantly impact people in very different ways um so we, i can't sit here and say that menopause will be a disability for for, for everybody um because it will simply depend on how how it impacts the individual um but ultimately the government have concluded that there is sufficient protection under the legislation as it as it stands today um which brings us on to um kind of a, a, a development that was announced i believe last week or the week before um so part of the consultation that i i mentioned just a few moments ago a menopause employment champion was appointed within government and they have published recently a policy paper and within that policy paper um, you can see um, on the screen there's a link there to to the um, kind of public announcement and also a help to grow campaign um, the public policy paper has developed a four-point plan um, under which the employment menopause employment champion is going to be developing best practice um, by sector, a portal for best practice um, by sector um, supporting menopause. They will be um, producing a sector allyship programme. Um, an allyship is a, a, a phrase that is increasingly becoming, becoming common and um, kind of really just um, it's an expression which means it's someone who is standing up for and against rather than kind of passively um, just watching things go by, if that's the, the, the right way to, to put it. Um, there will be advocate employers, so people, you know, employers who are displaying be best practice, who will become advocates within the um, sectors and in relation to menopause. And there will also be some sector based um, communications, all of which will be part of a help to grow campaign. And as I say, the link is there. Also, um, in addition to this four point plan, they will, the, the government and the menopause employment champion are going to be producing workshops over the next six months or so within particular sectors. And those sectors are retail, hospitality, care, manufacturing, and professional and technical, which I suspect covers pretty much every every sector. Um, although probably a few that are, are remitted from that, but I'm sure that there will be good best practice that that can be got out of those, even if you're not within those those particular sectors. Um, and just whilst I'm thinking about it. Rihanna and Ben, would you mind just monitoring the chat and the um, admissions, please? Um, we're all adjusting to Teams. I was far more adept at, at Zoom um, for these sorts of things, but it did, didn't help. I will just briefly say this. When I was doing a, an event for CIPD East London, and I flicked onto the screen to realise that I'd been talking to myself for approximately 20 minutes and somehow I'd been disconnected from the meeting. But there we go. I don't think that's happened yet today. So fingers crossed it, it won't. 
So moving on from um, menopause in, in the workplace, we're going to have a look at um, a recent case in the Employment Tribunal, which is the case of Hobbs v HR Lettings. Now you'll see that the amount that uh, Mrs Hobbs was awarded is, is zero. And um, that's the one and only slide where you will see that um, today in terms of cases that we are, we are talking about. And you can see on the slide just a brief summary of the case. Mrs Hobbs worked in a lettings um, business and she made allegations of bullying against her, I'm sorry, well, against in relation to bullying by her, by her colleagues towards her. Things that she um, complained about included colleagues raising their voice, that recruitment decisions were being made without them being having been discussed with her, a warning that was issued against her, but then retracted by by the business um, because her version of events hadn't been hadn't been heard. So yes, less than ideal that the warning was issued in those circumstances, but the business took appropriate steps to remove that that warning having issued it and also as she was off for a period of sick um of sick leave as a consequence of a build-up of, of of the circumstances her desk was moved whilst she was away and i suspect all of us would probably say you know those things weren't weren't ideal and certainly that was the the view of the employment tribunal thanks amanda um, and they said, you know, yes, the conduct that the individual has complained of is, in quotes, not ideal. And that is the phraseology that um, the employment tribunal used. She complained that none of her complaints were dealt with as well. The employment tribunal wasn't particularly complimentary about, about the business. And they said it was a, it was a bad environment um, within the office. And as can quite often be the case, Mrs. Hobbs and her colleagues did not always agree with, it, with each other. And it was a stressful and frustrating um, environment for everyone who was, who was involved, which may have led to, for example, the raising of voices um, and some expression of, of frustration. Now, Mrs. Hobbs in this particular case, those complaints not having been dealt with took the decision that she was, in her view, I emphasise, took the decision to resign her employment. And the question arose whether or not the, um, the circumstances that the individual was complaining about were sufficient to meet the threshold of a constructive unfair dismissal and, and allowing her the, the right or giving her the right to, to leave and, and, and resign. Now, just briefly by way of background, in order for there to be that right, there has to have been, in effect, a course of conduct or an intention on the party um, against whom the allegation is made to breach the implied term of trust and confidence. And what the Employment Tribunal said here was this case, yes, not ideal, not the best environment in which Mrs Hobbs was employed, but ultimately there was not enough in what she was complaining about in terms of a course of conduct, in terms of an intention or a likelihood that the actions of the business were sufficient to breach the implied term of trust and confidence. And for that reason, her claim failed. So she was, as I mentioned at the outset, not awarded any money whatsoever. And as you can see from the sort of speech bubble there, one of the managers, I think it was a director actually, um, in response to one of her, her complaints sort of said, you know, in, in reply, chin up granny, um, which again, not ideal, less than, um, you know, an, an ideal situation. And I think one of those circumstances where if I received the papers with that and saw that message, I'd probably grimace a little bit and, you know, kind of be a little bit, um, not quite sure what the right word is, but, you know, not, an, as I say, not an ideal, not an ideal situation. But I think this is 
this case emphasizes what we are starting to see coming through the employment tribunals um, system and, and, and the cases at the moment. And there seems to be a greater acceptance, if I can put it like that, of or a, a greater rejection might be the better way of, of, of putting it, of not just taking a, what an employee sees the situation as being, but actually balancing it in, in the circumstances and kind of looking at the circumstances of a, as a whole and deciding, well, actually on balance, this wasn't enough to entitle this individual to, to leave and to consider themselves to have been bullied. And we're not only seeing this within kind of the constructive unfair dismissal sphere, but, sphere, but also within um, allegations of discrimination and, and harassment. So I, I, amongst the team, we occasionally share um, articles and that sort of thing. And, and a member of our team shared an article regarding a sous chef, I think it was, um, who was alleging that um, they had been discriminated against. And this is me simply paraphrasing the article and, and not having read the case, which I have done for all, all of the others that we're talking about today. But they were alleging that they were being discriminated against because they had, you know, their colleagues were not saying please and thank you within the within the kitchen. And the employment tribunal in that particular instance rejected that the position that the the allegation that people were not saying please and thank you was was for a discriminatory discriminatory reason. So there is in certainly my my view and my experience currently a bit of a swing perhaps um, in a direction of, of, of travel away from perhaps just accepting what employees are saying and, and, and their interpretations and, and a push back. And some may see that as positive and, and some may some may not. So moving on from that, um, the next case is um, what we believe to be the, the first case dealing with um, transgender in, in the workplace, certainly the first case that I've, I've come across. Um, and this is a case of AB and Royal Borough Kingston um, upon, upon Thames. And again, this is a an employment tribunal case released and um, the decision was released relatively recently. It concerned an individual who um, gave notice to the borough that they were going to transition. So they gave notice in around about January 2020 that they and, and they actually transitioned in around about July of 2020. And the particular feature that I wanted to draw attention to um, and it links with something that I will mention towards the end, um, is what, what's described in, in the judgment as dead naming. So this particular individual, Miss AB, had um, a door card with, with their, um, I, I will say, original name um, on it, and also a locker with their original na name on it. Um, obviously within the systems of the borough, um, the individual was recorded with with one name, including pensions and and so on and so forth. And and the case doesn't go into it in a huge amount of detail. But what the case does note is that the names weren't all correctly updated to the individual's transitioned gender until March of 2023. So the individual transitioned in July 2020. And between the period of July 2020 and the period of March 2023, various aspects of the respondent system and third parties continued to refer to the individual within her, as, as the individual's, in quotes, dead name, which the employment tribunal um, and indeed the borough accepted was, was not an acceptable situation. And there were other aspects to this case that I will I will come on to. But the individual and Miss AB was was awarded £21,000 as a consequence of the um, the circumstances that, that that she experienced within the particular borough. 
So we'll come on to have a look at the other aspects to this, this particular case. And I think in one sense, credit does have to go to the borough of Kingston upon Thames, who accepted within, within the case that it had a number of outdated policies and, and procedures that did not cover the circumstances of, of a transitioning employee in, in the workplace. And it was one aspect of the case that Miss AB alleged that this was um, an act of discrimination. But the employment tribunal concluded it, you know, ultimately it was in effect one of those things. There was no, um, you know, the failure to, to have the correct procedures in place wasn't, wasn't directed at anyone, anyone in particular. Um, the language, um, there's two written um, uh, quotes from the judgment that are on the screen there. Um, one of her managers uh, in relation to a, a particular approach by the individual, by, by Miss AB, who was, who was raising matters in a work context in terms of a lighting project within, within the council. One of the managers replied, to another manager, do you want do you want her to get away with a hissing fit again? And this, I think, it was the same manager actually referred to the individual as as having gone native again. And this was in in exchanges of of emails. And again, I think if I'd have received that, I I, I almost certainly would have cringed um, a little bit because it's certainly not the sort of language that you would want your managers to be using about any employee. Um, and certainly the case does describe the language used in relation to Miss AB as derogatory and unprofessional at times. Now, the, the judgment without particularly identifying um, anything as such does suggest that there was a shift in attitude um, towards, the, towards Miss AB from November 2020 onwards. So if we remember in context, the individual had given notice that they were to transition in January 2020. They transitioned in July 2020 and the shift in approach um, appears to have been from, from November 2020. And the, the, the borough in response to that was saying, you know, ultimately her approach to the work that she was being asked to undertake, her approach to objecting to certain aspects of a lighting project and so on and so forth had, had changed and she was becoming more intransigent. And that was the cause of, um, of the situation. Equally, they, um, the tribunal sort of went on to conclude that um, the instructions weren't related to to the transition or any protect, protected characteristics and actually the respondent's position the reasons for the change in their behavior was was found to be um reasonable now where things perhaps outside of the dead naming situation started to go wrong perhaps um, for, for the borough of Kingston upon Thames was when the claimant made an allegation. Um, she made a complaint in, in December 2020. And the manager who received that complaint um, escalated the complaint to HR, which the Employment Tribunal concluded was entirely appropriate given the gravity of the complaints that were made within it, um, which included an, an allegation that the individual was being treated in a in a discriminatory way and the the response to to that as well as escalating it to HR was was for the manager to demand an apology um, which is not um, I would suggest um, an appropriate way in which a manager should respond to a complaint from from an employee let alone a manager who is responding to a complaint which is alleging um, discrimination. And I'm sure, hopefully, you would all recognise that isn't necessarily the best, the best approach for, for managers to, to take. And 
ultimately between the date of this complaint in in December 2020 um over a period of months there is a lack of progress um between December and um February onwards um and indeed actually to April which the tribunal did conclude the delay the lack of investigation was in part due to the individual's protected characteristic of their of their transition we then fast forward she raises uh, miss ab raises a formal grievance which is 114 pages um, long and um, there is a period of sickness as well and she returns after this period of sickness and she alleges that um, there is a reduction in in her workload which in part was due to a reluctance on the part of some of the managers to engage with the claimant which the informant tribunal concluded was for reasons connected with with her protected characteristic but they did also say in some some respects that not reallocating project back to the claimant following her return from maternity leave was a perfectly appropriate and reasonable approach for the for the borough to take. Um, and I, I can't remember off the top of my head how how long Miss AB had been had been off sick, but it's not uncommon, and I would say it is very common for workloads to have to be reallocated when individuals are are off sick. And similarly, if those projects are then reallocated back, that can be disruptive. Things have moved on. It can it can cause lost time, et cetera, et cetera. And it was it was useful, if I can put it like that, that the employment tribunal did say ultimately the respondents, the borough has acted perfectly reasonably in reallocating some of the projects and not reallocating them back. So reallocating some of the projects to others whilst the individual was off sick and not reallocating those back to the to the individual on their on their return. And that was a perfectly appropriate approach for for them to have taken. Now, that's not to say that is a reasonable and, and appropriate approach in all circumstances and that no such approach is ever going to be found to be discriminatory. There will be balances in terms of how long is the individual off for and so on and so forth. What's the urgency of the project? To round off the case, and this is summarising 40 odd pages of, 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 of complaint and judgment, the respondent, the borough did restructure at one um, and it, it's a restructure that affected the entire um, section of the business that the, the the Miss AB worked worked within, and at one point it was proposed that there would be a senior position that the claimant could have been suitable for. Through consultation, this position was removed, and it was presented. There was a senior individual within within the structure, but it was mapped to a colleague of the of the claimant rather than the claimant themselves, and again. The employment tribunal said, look, this is this is a reasonable approach. The evidence that the borough had put forward was sufficient to persuade the tribunal that the removal of that role was not directed at the claimant, but it was it was a, an appropriate, reasonable response for um, the, the borough to, to take. And it wasn't to try and avoid the claimant um, having having that role. Now, as I said, when I went on to this slide, um, there, there was there is much not to commend the borough about in terms of its approach and, and its policies but as a consequence of this case and I believe Miss AB continues to work within within the borough the borough have introduced a trans policy which they have um, put together in consultation with the with the claimant so something good in inverted commas has come out of that and, and certainly I think the borough as I say, they they did hold their hands up and accept that certain aspects of, of 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 their approach were not appropriate, including the dead naming, and also the the lack of up to date policies. Which, incidentally, when we're talking about um, incidents that were coming up in you know from sort of 2020, 2020 onwards, 
Um, bearing in mind the Equality Act has been around since I think 2010, if, if my memory is serving me correctly. Thank you, Rihanna, Rihanna's nodding. Um, this case and the policies within it referred to the predecessor legislation of the Equality Act. So that they were out of date by, by some, some margin. So that's um, the, the, the first case that we're aware of, certainly in terms of, of transgender in, in the workplace. And I'm going to move on to a topic that any of you who have seen me speak before know, I don't think we can ever get through an unemployment law update without touching on holiday pay. Um, and this update is, is no exception. So very briefly, I'm, I'm sure many of you will have seen the headlines um, in relation to the most recent holiday pay case. This is a case that has been knocking around Oh, mince pies, Rosie, yes, mince pies. I will come on to mince pies at the end, I promise. Um, I haven't got my badge on today, but I should have done. Um, so no, min mince pies comes later. So holiday pay, holiday pay. We'll do the professional bit first. Um, the case of Agnew uh, is um, a long, long running saga. I believe it started in 2018 in Northern Ireland and it is a case involving 300 and something odd, I believe, police and civilian staff within the Northern Ireland Constabulary. In short, these individuals claim that they were underpaid holiday pay in that their holiday pay did not include a calculation or compensation for overtime that they had worked. I will not bore you with the development of how holiday pay has um, uh, how holiday pay calculations has developed over the years but in short there was a case that basically said over time in certain circumstances should be included and that was the instigation for this particular case so so far so good um the employment tribunal um in northern ireland said i'm sure we're all familiar with the the idea that an employment tribunal claims should be brought within three months of a particular event and in the context of holiday pay, there are two means by which holiday pay can be claimed. One is under the working time regulations or the working time order, I believe it is in, in Northern Ireland. And the claim must be made within three months of the refusal of the right of um, holiday pay uh, or when the payment should have been made. The alternative is under the Employment Rights Act, or I think it's the Employment Rights Order in Northern Ireland which permits a claim to go back for longer, excuse me, providing that the claim is brought within three months of the last of a deduction in a, in a series. The Employment Tribunal in Northern Ireland said because of this need for there to be, you know, the three, li the three month time limit, they said if holiday pay was um, in terms of a series, if holiday pay is paid this is where my math is going to go wrong in January and then there's a payment in February that's fine because there isn't a gap of three months so the series can continue if however there is a payment of holiday pay in January and I'm going to pick a long enough gap to make sure I don't fall foul of three months and we say July is the next payment there is a gap of more than three months and therefore the series is broken and these individuals cannot go beyond the payment in July, I think I said, didn't I? So that was where, where we were. We've had a whole series of cases, and this case has gone up as far as the Supreme Court. So I'm very pleased to say that this is the end of it. Supreme Court is the highest court that this, this case can go to. And the Supreme Court has agreed with the Court of Appeal, which was the most recent decision, to say, Ultimately, however big a gap in, in payments of holiday pay and whether there is a correct payment of holiday pay somewhere in, a somewhere in the series, it does not matter. Providing a claim is brought within three months of the last payment, then the individual can, can go back as far as it, it needs to, in effect, regardless of any gap in, in payments or any, as I say, any correct correct payment. 
Now that's potentially significant in Northern Ireland and in this particular case. And I think from memory, the, 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 the comparison is the payment's either gonna be 300 or so thousand if the gaps broke the continuity. However, it could be 3 million, I think is the figure given this this case which has said actually the gaps don't don't break the continuity and i can just say it's flashed up um in terms of great britain so wales england scotland the position is that um once this case came out originally the the, the government sprung into action and they introduced a long stop date of two years so the furthest that people can go can claim back in in Great Britain is two years and that's two years from the date of claim so that's where we are uh, I'm pleased to say I, I if any of you have seen me talk about this case in the past um I, I did call this decision um which I'm very pleased to say it's it's very clear on the face of the the legislation and the wording that's um you know that that really was the natural conclusion and that's that's where we have where we have landed. So ultimately, if anybody has been waiting for this case to consider what your position is in relation to holiday pay, back pay, et cetera, this is the end of the this is the end of the road. Louise, you're 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 one step ahead of me. Just just bear with me in terms of the Harper Harper case. So yes, you you may need to have a look and decide. Um, what your business's approach is going to be. Um, I know this case has received a lot of press and I also know, for example, um, a client was in contact this morning um, asking about overtime in, in holiday pay. So I think the message is starting to get out to the, to the wider world and you might start to see queries start to, start to come up. If you do need, need any help in terms of that, then please do get in touch with any member of the team. We'll be we'll be happy to have a chat with you. So, Louise, you anticipated my next my next breath. So, um, Harper and Brazil is um, a case that involved a teacher. The consequence of that case is that individuals um, who are part year workers, in this instance, a teacher who works part year was deemed to be entitled to what I shall call a full year holiday entitlement. So let's say they work half of the year because they've worked throughout, assuming they remain employed throughout the full calendar year, regardless of how much they work during it. In this case, Brazil was entitled to 5.8 weeks holiday, despite the fact that they only worked a proportion of the year. Now, the government did spring into action quite quickly and they introduced um, a consultation process that has, has closed and we are currently awaiting the outcome of that consultation. Um, I haven't seen any updates in relation to that, but you know, again, you can you can follow the link and 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 or scan the code and that'll take you to the page of the consultation to see what was what was in, in discussion. Um, so I'm afraid there is an update, but the update is there's no update, I'm afraid. Um, government are simply looking at the responses to decide which way they, they wish to jump. My view is um, the government are very keen to simplify things so far as holiday pay. And all I can say is it's long overdue as far as I'm concerned. I spend far too much of my life talking about holiday pay and how it's calculated and bearing in mind it is you know, something that almost everyone is entitled to. It's it's a frustration for me, sort of dread to think how much of a frustration it is for you. So watch this space is is basically what I can say. Um, please do follow Beckett Long, link in with myself, Rihanna, Ben, and we'll be sharing updates um, as and when. And I'm sure um, if we are invited back to do the update for CIPD, in March, April time, if there is an update, we'll be covering it um, at that point too. So I clicked onto new and updated guidance. There are three things just to bring your attention to in terms of guidance and that's recently been released. So 
very topically, uh, CIPD has published a transgender and non-binary EDI um, in the workplace guide. I have read that. It's very, um, it is a very interesting read. It's a very useful read. And I would recommend any and all of you to get a copy of that and have a read through. Um, because whilst that case we've, we've spoken about is, is the first that we are aware of, um, it does highlight some deficiencies, um, both in terms of policies and, and approach. Um, so I'd encourage you to, to download that and think about what you might need to put in in, in your workplace as a consequence. ACAS mental health guidance, um, mental health, as I'm sure you'll all agree, is a, a very topical very important um, issue within the workplace and, and ACAS have just published um, a guide in relation to that. Finally, um, I'm fairly sure we had updated guidance about fit notes for employers and managers relatively recently, but that guidance has been updated again. So if you are dealing with fit notes within your day to day um, work, then please do have a look at that. And don't just you familiarise yourself with these guides, make sure the managers um, who are dealing with, with people on a day to day basis are aware of these updated guidance notes as well. Um, you know, if we go back to the you know, reasonable steps defence or reasonable steps defence, it's great if you're aware of it, but not so great if managers aren't. Um, so it is important that these, these guidance notes are shared and disseminated amongst um, amongst the workforce as well. So a new introduction to the updates from Beckett Long for, for CIPD. And this is an action list. I'm not intending this to be daunting. And I would hope that some or other of these things you don't need to, to think about. But, you know, we've, we've gone through with Rihanna and Ben some legislation that is, is going to be introduced. I fully appreciate that there is a lack of detail in relation to some of it. So please do, you know, again, keep an eye out on, on updates from us, from CIPD and, and indeed other, other sources. But do think about your contracts, think about your policies to identify what changes might need to be made because of the legislation that we are expecting to, to come in. A number of the things we've spoken about today are already um, have already been been passed and received royal assent we just lack the detail and indeed knowledge of when they're going to come in and in terms of any specific dates think about new policies so around the menopause around carers leave um neonatal leave very likely to need new policies but again perhaps lacking in detail at, at, at the moment but at least you've got them in your in your um horizon in terms of action actions to do Sexual harassment, um, policies, training, and all, you know, all very well to, to have the right policies, have training in place, but you do need to think about are they effective? You should be refreshing it um, on, a, on a relatively regular basis, you know, making sure it's covered in induction and, and those sorts of things. Um, as I said earlier, in terms of the, the updated guides, make sure not only are you aware of them, but also your managers are aware. Menopause policy and training, transgender policy and training and procedures for name changes. And in relation to the last one, um, as we've just spoken about, look at your holiday pay calculations and have a think about what this case might mean in terms of back pay liabilities. As I say, within Great Britain, we've got a long stop date of two years. So, um, not quite as significant as it might be if the organisation is is based in Northern Ireland, where they did not introduce that that similar similar provision. So that's all from myself, um, Rihanna and Ben, in terms of what we had planned to say. But we'll have a think about questions. So I have seen a couple of things ping up as we've been going through. Just in terms of the most important part, mince pies, I did promise to circle back to that. Um, my mince pies, I'm, I'm 
My mince pie tasting, for those of you who do not know, on an annual basis, I sacrifice myself to um, taste test as many mince pies as I possibly can, which are commercially available, and I will post my reviews on LinkedIn. So far, I don't think I've had an official mince pie taste test because, uh, again, those of you who follow me know I do take this extraordinarily seriously and approach approach it in a very scientific way. So I have to use the same bowl, two mince pies at a time with cream, having been blitzed in the microwave for 30 seconds. Currently, though, I did come home to a delivery from a client, no hints there by any stretch of the imagination, from Betty's Tea Shop in Harrogate. And I have to say, they were blooming delicious. However, they had they did not receive the official taste test. So they are currently leaders. But anyone who is interested in last year's um, mince pie taste test will know that, um, well, will know if you follow, have followed me, um, may not know, but as the crumble top mince pie is definitely the leader. But I haven't yet tasted those this year and they do have a habit of messing around with them. So that's my mince pie update. So please do follow me if you're interested in mince pies or indeed anything employment or HR related. Um, I do cover some of the some of that as well. So are there any questions as we've been going through that I've not picked up on and or that you guys haven't um, responded to? Oh, Costco. Someone someone did mention Costco over the weekend, actually. So thank you for that. Um, <laughs> Julie, a couple of people have mentioned, will the recording be on COPD website? Because some people can't get back onto Teams. Yes. Um, yeah. So the plan will be, if you have the Teams app, um, and I'm using, I'm I'm accessing Teams through the website, actually, which is why I'm, I'm not quite as confident as I would have been. Um, but yes, if you've got the Teams app, you should be able to find the recording in the chat box in the chat that relates to this event. If you haven't, all things being well, um, we will be sharing the recording on YouTube. Um, so if you just Google CIPD Essex and Ipswich YouTube, that will take you to the, the YouTube site and you will find hopefully this recording in due course, as well as um, previous recordings of previous events where we have had permission to record and, and share. So yes, in short, and I will find a way, if I can find a way, I will attach the slides as a file to the chat. And I'll also ask CIPD um, Central Office to hopefully add that to YouTube as well. But if you can't find it readily, if you want the slides, please do get in touch with um, Rihanna, Ben or myself. I'll pop if I can find it. Oh, there you go. There's our contact details and we'll we'll happily email them across to you. Just see, just in response to Charlotte's question. Um, yes, the, the length of neonatal leave is going to be dependent on how long a baby will spend in hospital up to 12 weeks with a minimum entitlement of one week. Not sure yet. Uh, don't think we have the detail yet on exactly how that will be calculated, but it, it will be dependent on how long how long the baby's um, been in, in hospital or neonatal care. So once we know a little bit more, we'll uh, provide some more detail on that. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of, of headlines that we've got covered and the, the mm. detail is lacking at the moment. Yeah. Um, but, you know, as I say, said in the, in the wrap up there, as long as you've got the information there, you know, it's on the horizon and you can look out for it when when it comes through. And we'll certainly be updating both as CIPD, I'm sure, and and, and as, as Birkett Long. Um, so, yeah, I think, Louise, you just questioned um, as I was talking whether what I was saying in relation to holiday pay fitted in with the, the UK case for holiday pay. And hopefully I addressed that. Um, and I think, is that everything? If anyone hasn't, you know, have put in a question that we've not answered, please do feel free to shout now um, and we'll happily 
and so there's some good suggestions in there from enterprise as well um and um, yeah please do please do join in with my mince pie tasting put forward your suggestions etc i'm very happy to take those and um go out of my way to taste test a mince pie i do love a mince pie right um so i think that's everything isn't it i think we've covered everyone all right well um it's been a great session um as i say we had nearly 500 people signed up to join which is fantastic um and at its height we had over 230 30 people on on the the update which is fantastic so a big thank you to rihanna and and ben for your for your support today um and just a reminder we have got two more events for CIPD Ethics and Ipswich coming up, um, building and only owning your professional network for enriched study experience and uh, first hiring, equity first hiring. That's, that's, I couldn't quite get my mouth around that the first time around. Equity first <laughs> hiring. Um, and we do have a very exciting event that is in development that we're hoping will be coming in as a face-to-face -face event in the new year so please do please do watch this space so a very big thank you to you all for coming um have a great rest of the afternoon and um hopefully we will see you either at another virtual event soon for cipd um or indeed a face-to-face -face. thank you thank you thanks everyone, everyone.